very comfy in front of our fires and spending time with our friends and with the Dharma. Never mind. <laughs> Never mind about that. Let's just start this morning um, with a few minutes of meditation. Our minds may already be quiet, which would be lovely. Um, if so, we'll just reinforce that, and if not, in the silence, let's see if we can find a space of calm within ourselves. Just focus on your breath for a few minutes. Whatever thoughts arise, let them be like fish in the sea coming to the surface and floating away. Don't get involved with them, just observe their coming and going. If you find that your mind does get involved with your thoughts and you're off thinking about what you're going to do for the rest of today or the last argument you had with someone, when you wake up and realize what's happening, don't get upset. Just make a mental note, thinking, and bring your attention back to your breathing. Now, still focusing on your breathing, imagine that with every exhalation, you breathe out 
whatever problems or stresses or anxieties or illnesses, whatever negative things you're holding inside, every time you exhale, breathe those out in the form of black smoke. All of those problems are exiting from your mind, your body, every time you exhale. And don't think you're sending them to other people, that you're sharing them with the people around you. As soon as they exit from you, they disappear completely. So as you do this, your body and your mind together gradually begin to feel lighter, begin to be lighter, less heavy, less dark, With every exhalation, all that is negative within you becomes less and less. Now as you continue to exhale these negativities, with every inhalation, imagine that you're breathing in white, purifying light. White light in, ever diminishing black smoke out. So gradually, your body begins to fill with white light. all your flesh, your organs, your bones, your cells. From the top of your head to the tips of your toes,
filling up with white light, pervaded by white light. Dispelling completely all that black smoke, all those problems, anxieties, negative karma, illnesses, everything, dissolving completely. Your mind, too, is pervaded by all the positive qualities carried by this white light. Relax your mind. Allow it to become clear and focused. filled with kindness and love and compassion. And wisdom. So just allow yourself to rest in this state of purified clarity. Your body completely filled with white light, crystal clear. Your mind completely relaxed. and clear. All negativities dispelled. So now, in this state of clarity, focus your mind for a few minutes 
on setting your motivation. Think about why you're here, what you hoped to accomplish. What's the purpose? What's the purpose of being here in this room? What's the purpose of your life? (coughs) Think in both short-term and long-term contexts. From a Buddhist perspective, the biggest, the broadest, the most extensive and vast motivation is that of bodhicitta. The strong determination to become enlightened oneself in order to be of the maximum service and benefit to all other living beings in the universe. Obviously that's a tall order. But if we have a really big goal rather than a small goal. (coughs) Then that can, in fact, broaden and deepen our understanding of ourselves in unexpected ways. What's also important, however, is to have a positive goal, whatever that may be. And if possible, one that is, that diminishes our self-centeredness and nourishes the altruistic part of us. So a goal that motivation that takes into account the welfare of others. So create your own motivation. For this class, for this day, and for beyond, if possible. But make it very clear and very strong. Because that motivation will, or can, depending on its strength and its nature, have a profound effect on your actions that follow. And if your motivation is positive, then that effect itself will be positive. So take a couple of minutes just to establish a strong motivation for yourself.
So what was today's title again? <laughs> okay. Happiness without attachment. Find the right there we go. Mm -hmm. I know I know the theme. I just wasn't sure what the title was. I wanted to make sure I knew what why you all had come. <laughs> A little bit of water would be okay. Just water is fine. Um, great. Okay. So, just so I have a sense of who's here and what the background is and all of those, you know, sort of details. How many of you are doing Discovering Buddhism? Okay. About half, maybe. A little bit more. Um... Those of you who aren't doing Discovering Buddhism, how did you hear about this and what attracted you to come? And please, just pop up. I'm absolutely... Yes, thank you. <laughs> Someone popped up. <laughs> okay. So, that's the Wednesday class? Okay. Great. All right. So how many of you who aren't doing Discovering Buddhism are doing the Wednesday class? One, two, three. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, that, that helps. Got it. Thank you. So is there anyone here who isn't doing any other classes and just decided to sort of visit? Oh, interesting. Okay. This is what I'm interested in, too. <laughs> Why? What interested you to come? That's my question. Well, I've, I've known that you, you folks were in town. Um, and I, I'm in a place right now. I'm a, I'm a therapist here in town. And okay. I work with behavioral change and growth. Um, it's becoming really rote. I feel like I'm just repeating myself. Okay. And I just want to deepen my, my, my experience, my connection with... Uh, Okay. Okay. That's thank you. Thank you for sharing. That's wonderful. Oh, I hope. Kelly. Yes, Kelly. Okay. And I um, uh, spent a lot of time at the mandala. I spent a lot of time uh, talking to one of the monks. I realized I was I had the wrong teacher. A different center. I see. Center for oh, through North Carolina and uh, Albuquerque and here maybe seven years. I see. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes. Well, I came because I started practicing meditation about a year ago, and I realized how helpful it was. And um, your talk just seemed really interesting because I like being happy. Hey, <laughs> don't we all? <laughs> okay, all right. Thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is Paul, and I'm in the country. I'm from the country. My father died on December 28th. I'm sorry for your loss. I've come here before, and my friend John mentioned here. And I've gone to the Upaya Zen Center, taking some workshops, and I've also taken workshops with very much enjoy with Alan Wallace and uh -huh. Sarah Institute. Yes. And so for me, it's great to cultivate uh, calm and clear, clear and focus and attention and try to cultivate a pure heart. Wonderful. Working from 10 years ago was not, it was a pure heart, but it was definitely skewed. I see. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Mm. Anything to share? Okay. Great. Well, welcome. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing. This is really... Oh, oh something? I, I wanted to get some uh, other, other views on attachment. Okay. Big subject. <laughs> yeah, big subject. Exactly. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, it's great to see you all here. It's lovely. Thank you very much. Um, 
I should, um, for those of you who think you've come to a talk, I should clarify. <laughs> that's, that's probably not so much what this is going to be, um, in that uh, my method tends to be a bit more um, uh, d d discuss discussion-based, you know, uh, question Socratic, maybe you could call it, um, sharing, a lot of sharing, you know. So we, we kind of come to, hopefully, we'll see, come to conclusions or insights perhaps together um, by sharing our own experiences, you know, and uh, like that. But we'll see how it goes, you know. Um, my understanding is that... Our, where are you in Wednesday's class? Oh, okay. You. Oh, okay. All right. So <laughs> renunciation. You have done that. Great. And in uh, discovering Buddhism. Yeah, we were hoping to get a little further. We just got through the small scope pretty much. I touched on um, a little bit of renunciation last Sunday. Not so Not much. So much. Okay. Okay. So uh, we're going. Uh, we're going to talk, we're going to go at happiness without attachment a bit from the side in discussing something within Buddhism that's called renunciation. Ooh, weird word. You know, sounds very negative and like ascetic and doesn't it, you know? Like giving up, giving up, giving up. Oh gosh. Um, so what is that apart from you know, the, the immediate connotations of the mind, of, of the word, sorry. Um, what does renunciation mean to you? Especially those of you who have studied, but not only. You know, what, what is renunciation to you? Yes. I had a whole list of things that I wanted to bring with me. And then um, I realized that the whole thing is that I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh dear. And someone that I had a strong connect connection with. Okay. And um, there's a line, I think, that it's like if you still have attachment to cyclic existence, you're not renounced. You're not renounced. Mm -hmm. And my understanding, I mean, that, that kind of, that, that, what happened to this man kind of blew up everything I, I had in my mind out of the water and kind of moving to another state. And so I sat in a not renounced. And I think that if I were renounced, I wouldn't feel sad for this person's death. Okay. So I guess I feel that um, renunciation is, um, has to do with equanimity, with balance, with understanding the nature of samsara, okay. with understanding the nature of objective emotions that arise in relationship, and not having the view of empty. I know that I don't have that view. That view is not arisen in me. And so I have impatience. I have um, <coughs> grief. I have um, uh, laziness. I have these um, qualities that arise from not being renounced. Yeah. Okay. Experience other beings and have compassion, but it means that the suffering that comes from those emotions that arise is gone. That's what renunciation means. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Anybody else want to share? What does renunciation mean to you? I looked up the word this morning in the dictionary. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's that's a good start. Well. 
Yes, that's true. And but what it seemed to indicate was is giving up something but with value of value. In other words, to sacrifice something. That's the Webster dictionary okay. definition of it. All right. And I thought that was interesting because it's pretty much the opposite within Buddhism. In okay. Yeah, giving it's all about cyclic existence. Right. One of the, I think one of the cool things about so many of the different aspects of this study is, is that you can get, if you unpack renunciation, you can get the entire thing. It's all in there. Mm -hmm. If you unpack karma, you can get the whole thing. It's all in there. Yeah. You can, you can, there's so many entry places, and it literally will take you right down to the one, the same thing, once again, cyclic existence and, you know, doing things that, giving up things keep us, all of us, the whole, all sense of beings in that position. So okay. That's what it's starting to mean to me in my mind. That's, again, that's what's starting to settle in, sink in, in a deeper and deeper level. Okay. All right. Transforming ignorance into wisdom, hatred into compassion. Okay. All right. I like to think it means just letting go of um, expectations and outcomes. Uh, I've had many years of training uh, that have taught me that I deserve what I want. And mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, striving for, you know, having things come out the way that I, I would like them to. Yeah. Uh, uh, and that's not serving me well anymore. <laughs> okay. I'd like to renounce that. Okay. Okay. In a Western definition. That's that's okay. We are. That's where we're all from here. <laughs> yes. I think it has something to do with being willing to be uncomfortable. Um, and okay. 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 Yes. Um, Thank you. When you're faced with deep loss, you realize that um, your attachments run a lot deeper than you thought. And so you have to look at things so that you don't, I would say, overindulge in loss, the sense okay. of loss, because then you start having this whole basket of stuff that you're carrying around. And I'm thinking of the word renunciation in terms of perhaps renaming things in order to clarify what's valuable and what isn't valuable. Because you don't want to throw the baby out with the bath, you know? Okay. You can't throw out what is valuable. Things are valuable, whether it's in, you, in, in the field of your actions, certain things are useful actions. Yes. And in the field of your action, things, certain things are not useful actions. Mm. When you compare to how your attachment is to those things, can is it possible, I'm trying this, this is an exercise that I haven't mastered yet, but can I refocus so that things that are of a negative view can be turned, renamed, to be replaced by a better perspective? So what I'm talking about is re renouncing frames of mind, not mm -hmm. necessarily mm -hmm. renouncing cookies, you know, but mm -hmm. <laughs> which has a value sometimes and not others. <laughs> right. But but trying to renounce frames of mind that I've found rather damaging okay. by transposing their meaning. Okay. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. All right, I want to back up just a second here um, with a couple of things. First of all, what Daniel said is very true, right? When you study the Dharma, when you study Buddhism, it doesn't matter what topic, you know, you can start with A, you can go to Z, and it will lead you all back, you know, it will all lead you to the rest of the alphabet. Doesn't, it, 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 that's incontrovertible. Um, 
At the same time, however, it's really useful to have really clear what A is as distinct from B, as distinct from C and D and, and so on. So uh, we're going to um, operate at that level for this discussion, at least to start with, right? Um, we're, um, we're going to deal with renunciation and, you know, what, what stems directly from renunciation and what are the elements we need to understand in direct regard to renunciation specifically. So to some degree, that's going to mean leaving out of the discussion, at least to start with, bodhicitta, emptiness, you know, a lot of other things. But, you know, the things that are directly related to renunciation, those are the things we're going to keep in the discussion for the moment. Now, as the discussion progresses, we may, you know, find that we start to push the boundaries of that, and that's fine, but we need a starting point that's very clear. So that's the first thing. Um, so, we've talked a little bit about, you know, around renunciation, and the term cyclic existence has come up several times. What's that? Could I hear you define renunciation? In a minute. Okay. I'll come back to it. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll get there. <laughs> We're coming back. Reincarnation. Reincarnation is cyclic existence. Okay. The constant round of birth and death. The constant round of birth and death. Anybody else? What goes around comes around, okay. Anybody else? So is it, par is it possible to reincarnate, be a part of the constant round of birth and death, and not have that be cyclic existence? Yeah. Outside of that? No, I don't mean to step out to be in it and have that not be cyclic existence. You've said cyclic, I mean, what you've said to me is cyclic existence and reincarnation are the same thing, right? Or cyclic existence and the constant round of birth and death are the same, the same thing. What I want to know is can you be a part of the constant round of birth and death and not be in cyclic existence? You say, grasping. I think that cyclic existence is grasping, uh, continuing to return and return through um, desire, um, those things. And if you attain, if, if in Buddhism, uh, what arises in the mind is enlightenment mind, or you reach a level, as my understanding is, if, you re if there's a level that's reached, you can um, come back. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you can be a part of yeah. taking rebirth and not be in cyclic existence. Yeah. So then that's not a suitable definition, is it, of cyclic existence? If if you can if you can be a part of the definition and not a part of the term, then somehow they don't one doesn't define the other. So what I'm looking for is a kind of a definition. What is cyclic existence? So if you're born into one of the six realms of cyclic existence. In this case, your bodhisattva necessarily doesn't come back in one of the realms. Do Lama Zopa? <laughs> His Holiness the Dalai Lama? But he's out, he's out of choice, so is that still, is he coming back in one of those? He's, he is, yeah, he's in one of those realms, of course. Yeah. Okay. 
So then what is so then what is cyclic existence? I'm getting confused between rebirth and reincarnation. I see them rather different. We can all be reborn, that's our problem. But can be reincarnated um, totally consciously. So we can affect uh, the world, um, the universe, and the universe is in in positive way. Um, so I'm getting confused in Okay, we're, we're not using the two terms differently here. We're not. No. No, we're not. So what then is cyclic existence? Okay. But, but in, in that same sense, happiness could be going round and round as well. Uh, I don't know, cy cyclic uh, existed. Uh, to me, it seems like all of the, diff the different experiences that I have, it keeps coming around to me experiencing them. Okay. So uh, when I think of cyclic, Existence. I'm, I'm thinking of a wheel rolling down the road. Okay. I mean, the wheel's going around, but it's also going forward. If you're in the wheel, it's cyclic. If you're observing it, it's just moving linear. I don't. Unless it's just <laughs> on a, on a on a spindle on an axle, on an axle just going around. Yeah. I can wake up in the morning and make decisions about what I want, the person I want to be, and within 15 minutes I'm not, I'm cursing someone because they, you know, pulled out in front of me. At okay. The road. So, I mean, I can experience a cyclic existence. People seem to be talking about a lifetime, but I mean, I can, an hour, you know, make a decision to be a compassionate, kind, thoughtful person, and an hour later, <coughs> and she'll excuse the expression, an asshole. Mm -hmm. So then I have to make that decision again. Be a kind, thoughtful, uh, patient person. So what's happened in the meantime? Not out there. Yeah. In yeah. here. What's happened in here in the meantime? I think in, in some ways my past catches up with me. <laughs> Interesting way of putting it. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I think we all have these things we struggle with, um, you know, greed. And my, my struggle is with fear. Okay. I have a pacemaker in my chest, mm. and uh, I have a, a heart condition, and my heart starts beating fast, and when it starts beating really fast, the pacemaker, it gives me an electrical I shock. See. Yes. And uh, I had a bad pa pacemaker at one point, and it shocked me 30 times. And um, I have this intense fear of this <laughs> machine that was in my chest. So <laughs> as my daughter said, you know, if you're afraid of sharks, you can pretty much spend your life avoiding them. And um, But the thing that I am most afraid of is in my chest. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, fear is the thing that okay. brings me around, you know, on okay. an hourly basis. Fear catches up with me. Okay. All in, right. In a way. And I lose my faith. Hmm. Hmm. So what is cyclic existence? We throw around these terms, but we need to really know what they are, well, don't we? Right. Yes. Continue okay. Existence. Okay. But what you know, we talk samsara, right? Big Buddhist word, you know, really common. We talk about 
you know, we're all in samsara and we want to get to nirvana and, you know, I feel like I should call AAA for a trip ticket, you know, of how to get from A to B, you know, sort of thing. What is that? You know, where is it? Where, where does, where, let's, let's try this one. Where is cyclic existence? It is. Uh, in in the body. Body. Okay, getting closer. <laughs> Inside. In the mind. Well, but it's not only inside, it's outside in nature of cyclic existence. Really? Yeah. Things die and they're reborn. Right. But is that samsara? I didn't say it was samsara. I said that, it was but samsara existence. and cyclic existence are, are synonymous. They're manifestations of samsara. The trees and everything. They're part of it. The causation may be for us personally within inside each one of us, but I don't think that the trees are necessarily a total illusion. They're out there. <laughs> no, we're not, we didn't say they were an illusion. We didn't say they were an illusion. So if so if cyclic if samsara, if cyclic existence is in you, you know, within your mind. Is it all of your mind? It depends. I mean, mind can be nirvana. It depends on, on our understanding of the nature of reality. If our understanding of the nature of reality is without obscuration, that's nirvana. If our understanding of the nature of reality is obscuration, and cyclic existence, <laughs> then, then that would be some summer. Okay. But let's not talk about, um, let's talk about right now, in this moment, right? Is all of your mind samsara in this moment? <clears throat> no. We've got a few no's over here. No? There's another no. No. So what what part of your mind is not samsara? It's the awareness and the freedom from reaction, this intent and consciousness, and freedom from just falling into old habits and old reactions. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? The desire to... Uh, not being some sorry since next to some sorry in my mind. Okay. All right. The desire to not be in some Or nirvana. Or, or so we want to not be in nirvana either. No, uh, nirvana sits next to some Oh, I see. I see. I understand what you're saying. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. So some of our mind is some so we said, what part of our mind isn't samsara? So what part of our mind is samsara? Thought patterns. Our thought patterns. Bringing me my thought patterns. Bringing me in samsara. And patterns. All thought patterns? No. Okay. So what, what, what kind of thought patterns? Okay. All right. The opposite. My mind is in samsara. My mind creates samsara. And it lives in my mind. But my mind is not samsara. Okay. My mind can also create what is the opposite of samsara. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I've been told. <laughs> it's, it's rumored that. <laughs> Okay. Certain ways of thinking, or certain attachments, certain, you know, less hatred, ignorance, you know, 
those sorts of things. Yeah. Okay, but you're making, at the moment, at least in the way you've put yeah. the words together, you're making a distinction between mind and the things it's dismantling, such as attachment, ignorance, and so on. Are those elements not part of mind? They're creating mind and held in mind like the cloud in the sky. It's not the sky, it's the cloud. So they're not mind? I don't think so. No, they're, they're, they're products of karma. It travels in mind, it travels in consciousness. I see consciousness as a, as a highway. And it can be crowded, it can be not crowded. It can have things, it can have, I don't know. It's just a, it's a pure flow of energy. <clears throat> and you and what happens to it is what happens to it. Okay. 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 <laughs> you can send me another email. <laughs> I did. I did. Thank you very much. <laughs> if I'm following this right, um, we're saying that samsara is the same as cyclic existence. Yes. Existence. So For the, the purpose that, of the yes. So the things that wouldn't be samsara are things that I hold on to, the things that I am attached to that are not cyclic. Mm, not sure that follows, actually. But it's good to recap, so maybe we should recap. Um, all right, so we've said, we've come to the conclusion that samsara and cyclic existence are uh, synonymous. Right? We can use the terms, so just so we're all clear about terminology, that's the language we use communicates, so if we have to be on the same page to be communicating. So, we've said that. We've talked about uh, samsara slash cyclic existence, not so much being out there, but being in here, right? Being an aspect of, of our internal world. We'll start there. In, more general sense. And we've, but we've also talked about it as being <coughs> related to, we'll put it, the mind, right? Samsara is how I experience moment by moment by moment. It's my experience of living in this body moment by moment by moment. And if I experience something as painful, Okay. Okay. All right. I'm going to throw something slightly new in here. Uh, no, helpful. Hel I, th I think helpful. I hope helpful. <clears throat> Another synonym for samsara and cyclic existence is conditioned existence. Right? This might actually be the, the light bulb. <laughs> because conditioned existence as opposed to unconditioned existence might help us to understand what the nature of samsara is. So if samsara is an aspect of our internal workings, therefore an aspect, at least, related to our minds, right? And we've talked about conditioned by obscuration or not conditioned by obscuration, right? So samsara, we can think of cyclic existence, conditioned existence, we can think of in terms of, you know, what we talked about in terms of, you know, those negative thought patterns. Our experience, you know, and our, our reaction to whatever comes to us that's obscured, conditioned by obscuration in the mind. Right? Now, 
that conditioning arises through cause and effect. If you've gotten to the lam rim part of talking about samsara and renunciation, you've already talked about karma. So, cause and effect, you know, actions, our actions and the imprints of those actions, the, 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 the nature of our actions being linked to the types of results that those actions yield, right? Negative actions yielding suffering results, positive actions yielding positive results, right? So, and, you know, at the more subtle level, wrong view or obscurations in the mind simply being self-perpetuating in one sense or another, creating the cause, yielding the effect, that effect itself being a cause, yielding a similar effect, and self-perpetuating itself, right? Conditioning. We do, you know, we steal. Next time it's easier to steal. Why? Because we've put an imprint and we've, we've put the seed of a habit in our minds. We're accustomed. Familiarity. So strange, you know, that, you know, the workings of karma, it's not strange at all, sorry, that's just silliness on my part. The, the, the workings of karma, understanding the workings of karma can give us utter insight into why we should meditate. Creating habits, you know, creating habits, undoing habits. It's all about familiarity and undoing familiarity, creating familiarity with the positive, undoing our familiarity with the negative. Anyway, that's my little plug aside, the, the advertisement for the day. So, um, so conditioning, right? We're conditioned by what? Karma and delusion, the afflictive emotions that were mentioned earlier. That's why we're on this wheel, because of the self-perpetuating nature of cause and effect and our familiarity with the delusions. So the delusions lead us to action. The action creates imprints. The imprints nurture the delusion, which leads us to action, which leads us to imprints, which leads us to more delusion, and so on. That's the circle. That happens to then, you know, when we come to die, that happens to propel us over and over into rebirths. Okay. But what I'd like you to understand and to sort of come out of this with is the moment-by-moment moment part of this. The, the, what happened in that hour between the intention to be a good, thoughtful, compassionate person, you know, and getting really pissed off behind the wheel at the person who cut, cut us off in traffic. What happened in, in there? What is happening in our minds moment-by-moment-by-moment? And what does renunciation have to do with any of that? Right? So, are we all... Anybody have any questions? Before we... <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Anybody have any really pressing questions before we move forward? <laughs> decided that being in a body is not necessarily the sake of existence? I mean, have we, have we come to an agreement on that aspect of it? Or I think so. <laughs> they, they kind of give me that impression that, that, it's, that, that a body isn't a defining characteristic. It depends on the nature of the body and the mind. 
and sort of the evolutionary nature, let's put it that way, of the body and the mind that, that, w that determines that. But it's not, um, it's not one of those factors that, it's not a defining factor. Is that sort of jive for you? Well, <clears throat> I would have to think about it. I okay, mean, that's good. Yeah. Because, I mean, technically, um, my understanding is that the, uh, the nature of the aggregates themselves are suffering. Yes. Um, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand how... But why are they suffering? <clears throat> why is their nature suffering? Because of the cause. So if the initial cause for rebirth was this ignorance... Born into suffering, uh, but let's say we pass beyond suffering, you know, due to the kindness of our teachers and so forth. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. I have to. Yeah, no, it's 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 a complex topic for sure. Please think about it. That's great. But I mean, I'm I'm thinking. I'll just throw this into your thought process. You know, I'm thinking that in the case of His Holiness. You know, Chen Rezig, what's the cause of taking, taking a body is completely the cause is bodhicitta, right? The, ca the cause of taking that body is the wish to help sentient beings, period. You know, there's no ignorance left. There's, there's, so where is the samsara in that? Well, um, I don't know. I guess Lord Buddha doesn't reincarnate technically, right? You know, once you reach Buddhahood, you don't, you don't, you don't, uh, you don't go into a body again. You know, no. doesn't, doesn't. Uh, he said, "This is my last rebirth." You know, that was like what he, I don't know. That was one of the things that I've read. You know, what he said to, what he said to. Uh, that may be, in, that may, I mean, that may have been a teaching on his part, but certainly, you know, Chen Rei. All Buddhas can manifest, can take millions of rebirths, you know, take millions of bodies, let's put it that way, can take, you know, in order to, can appear to us in all sorts of ways, you know, Chen Rezig appears as His Holiness, so. For some so. Of it's a matter of choice. Sorry? For Buddhas, it's a matter of choice. Yes, yes, certainly. So, anyway, that's food for, that's food for thought. That's food for thought. How many people are in this world? Perhaps 30 or 30 Buddhas? Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly really, really good for the mind to think of it like that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll have to, I, I have to, uh, absent. How do you realize it? But that is the reality. Possibly. So are you saying there... Uh, can be sick until existence without a body. Yes. And can there be suffering without a body? Yes. Could you elaborate on both of those, please? Uh, as a part of um, the six realms of cyclic existence, right? The six realms that that in Buddhist cosmology that where you can take rebirth, right? Um, in the formless realm, the formless realm of the God realms. There, uh, they, there is no body. There's just mind. There's not gross suffering, but there is subtle suffering. Uh, so yes. But apart from that realm, yes. Is there sick or existence without a body? That's. You have a subtle body, though. You do have a settled bardo body. So, um, even in the formless realm, from the tantric perspective, you have a subtle body. That's true. That's and also true. Always some subtle matter with the mind. Yes. So, at some level, you've always had a body in some sort of different forms. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. Depends on what what philosophical level you're speaking from. Can you pick up here just a Absolutely. To the definition again of 
cyclic existence yes. and samsara yes. uh, being synonymous. However, it seems as if some beings can enter into one of those realms and not suffer the, the result of samsara. Like the Buddha who reincarnates himself yeah. as a bodhisattva to be the helpful of all beings. Is that person suffering in samsara? No. Okay. So then samsara is not the definition of a cyclic existence because the person did come back in a cyclic way even though he chose to on one of the six realms, right? No. It, well, that person came back in a body right. uh, with the appearance of, uh, you know, of a particular, you know, of the bodies of a particular realm. But in, in, in actual fact, that person isn't in that realm and therefore isn't in psychic existence, and therefore isn't in samsara. There's the appearance, you know. You know, Lamieshi had a body, right? And that body manifested extreme heart disease, you know, and died. And so, was Lamieshi in samsara or not? It's honestly, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. It's, 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 it's more complicated question than just a yes or no answer, I believe. So, yeah, right. Yes. Yes. There. Or both, neither. <laughs> both, neither, none of the above does not apply. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm, that's what I'm saying. I, I'm not sure that it's as simple as a yes or no answer. But maybe. Oh, my. Oh, my. I know. But let's just, let's, let's, let's leave that apart. Mm-hmm. come back, I've been thinking a lot about conditioning lately. When I'm five years old and we're playing musical chairs, I was the best musical chair player in the world. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> okay. And I started realizing how much conditioning was taking place that early in this game. For winning. For winning. Okay. All the different aspects of that. Okay. The strengthening of the self, and all the stuff. Yes, right? yes. Do I carry that, those that they created tremendous poor karma later maybe in my life. Okay. Right, I just carry the result of it or do I carry that exact next time I'm on my horn, will I still be a really good musical chair player? I <laughs> see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know I know, I know. I'm I'm not I'm not trivializing your question at all. Right. Um You really? What's your inta- What's your motivation? No, I, <laughs> I, honestly, I'm not sure. I think, uh, um, I mean, karma is very complex in the sense of, you know, we we do one action, and um, that action brings all sorts of. Uh, it brings a whole cluster of experiences with it. So your musical chairs thing, you were developing physical skills. You were developing sort of um, assessment mental skills on the, you know, the situation and strategic sort of, you know, kinds of skills and all sorts of things. Plus your, you know, the, the winning got you, you know, kudos and perks and, you know, and a sense of I'm so good at this. And so Lots of different things are happening there. Now, you have a particular body in this life, so the physical skills are applicable to this body. Um, the, the karmic connection with developing physical skills may be carried forward, but the actual skills are kind of uh, limited to th- these muscles, so your next life, it, that that karma, that aspect may, it, it's not that it'll go away, because karma doesn't go away, but it may not be applicable, right, 
to the particular situation in which you're you're reborn in your next life. So, so it. Skills here to create a karma. I mean, if I use these physical skills to do something that then cre created not a physical response. Oh yeah, of course. I mean, you you will you'll you, you would continue to use those in this life, and they would blossom in all sorts of all sorts of other things. But the direct sort of karma of that might not become useful to you for ten lifetimes. Who knows? You know, but there may not be any chairs. There we go. Also, you know that yeah, you're right. Yeah. Renouncing, <laughs> but we can renunciate too. <laughs> I don't know. I, okay, what are we renouncing? If we've gotten a bit clearer about what is samsara, right? What is conditioned existence? So, what are we renouncing? Well, <laughs> revolution. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm going to make a suggestion. It is 11:20. We've still got a ways to go. Let's take a five-minute break. So, so you're left with that question: What are we renouncing? Now, stand up, move around, have some tea. You know, five, ten minutes at the most, and I'll ring the bell, and we'll come back. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Before we move on to what are we renouncing? I thought maybe it would be nice if we had a working definition of conditioned existence that, that's uh, 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 free of Sanskrit. <laughs> that helped, you know, because uh, Sanskrit free, exactly, Sanskrit free. So I'm going to throw this out and just see if we can move with this one. So um, existence that is conditioned by um, habitual negative patterns of uh, I just had it habitual negative patterns of um, reaction, thought, and behavior. Okay. No. Okay. Take out the negative. Habitual patterns right. of reaction, thought, and behavior. Does that work? Okay. Yeah, please. Afflictive. Right. Which we can have. We can be very conditioned yes. to have positive states yes. of mind, but they aren't taking us outside of some sort. Right. We're still at some level dissatisfactory. Right. Conditioned existence is, is where there's still a result that is only within conditioned existence, if you will. <laughs> Maybe it becomes a self limiting. Re referring, re a self referential um, definition. <laughs> it's pleasant know. today. May not be pleasant tomorrow. What can enjoy today? But even you know, what's like what's I, pleasant. I might like my wife today, but tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> your wife or your wife? Oh. Oh. <laughs> you know, especially when it comes to her. Uh, exchanging one set of conditions for another set of conditions. Isn't that kind of what we're doing in a way? 
With practice? At the beginning, yes. So do you want to add something to it? Yeah, I don't know. But you're not sure what to add? Yeah. All right, yeah, all right. Cool. But we need to hear about the results being happening only within conditioned existence. Okay, good. This yeah. Okay, self-limiting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. You had asked the question a while back. Uh, you said, "What happens in between being in, in loving compassion?" flipping somebody off because they cut you off yes. in traffic. Yes. I'm really I'd be really interested in, in in discussing that a little bit. What happens in between there? And and you said and, and how does renunciation renounce you know, right. how does that relate to it? Okay. All right. Let's I think we can get to that by the end, but thank you. Okay. So if this is Given the caveats, if this is kind of a working Sanskrit-free Sanskrit definition of samsara that we can sort of hold on to in the, backs of, in the back of our heads, then what is it that we are renouncing? What is renunciation in relation to that, and what are we renouncing? Like Rowena said, are we giving up cookies? Nope. <laughs> We're not giving up cookies. No. Nope. <laughs> There's a definite no over here to no, not renouncing cookies, okay? <laughs> it's more the uh, nature of your reaction to cookies. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, like, um, such as what? Such as lust for cookies. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> such as lust for cookies, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So we're renouncing lust. I'm not taking a leave it, you know. We're renouncing the condition. Yeah, the, the, okay. The condition itself, the actual the, the brainwashing, the, the, the cells in the job, the, the, the condition. Okay. But if our conditioning is sort of um, primarily, if we've been lucky enough so that our conditioning is, you know, primarily, you know, be patient, be kind be compassionate, and so on. Is that what we're renouncing? Yeah. Really? If it's conditioned, yes. If it's conditioned, you want to be, that's not, what you, that's not the way you want to go. Okay. The, uh, the opportunity to go either way. Or whatever, I guess. That's, but, um, I don't think that just because it's a meritorious thing that uh, if it's just a condition replaced by you not, that's not the way you want to go. Okay. So if you're an so if you're an habitually kind person. Yeah, well it'll break down <coughs> for a long time. It's like that and you know, to, to hold up under real stress. <laughs> <laughs> because at the root we're all really crappy people or what? <laughs> okay, all right. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. But I want to, I want Thank you. to have freedom to be able to see when it is mm -hmm. this conditioning that I can look at. Okay. And see if that's a, and that's where to me, Shalita comes in, and the meditation comes in, to be able to see things more clearly, and then to know if, that, if that's something I choose to learn to renounce or not, to renounce or not. Okay. So then, Space and freedom is kind of an objective we're working toward. Okay. All right. Yes. I thought it was about replacing habitual patterns that don't serve you with 
patterns that do. So who cares if the ones that serve you are habitual? Isn't that the idea? That you want okay. to uh, develop new responses and healthy views and healthy mm -hmm. thoughts? Okay. Isn't that what I'm striving for? I thought that's what I was striving for. Okay. <laughs> it's still conditioned. For the moment, for the moment. I was told um, by one of my teachers that one of the reasons we meditate is so that when crisis occurs, it's the thing we reach for instead of acting out. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a conditioning. You know, yes, it is. Really yes, it is. So you're saying so you're saying that renunciation is devoid of morality? Yeah, I think so. I How do the rest of you feel about that? It's like, it's My conditioning deals me is not too good. <laughs> <laughs> How does one make choices? That it arises. It arises. So you don't make them on the basis of, of set views, past views. You are, it's, it will arise. You make choices from a place of freedom, which isn't a place of past. It, it integrates out all, all aspects of your being. I think quite difficult. It is. No, I mean, I think difficult for that to lead you anywhere but into the hell realms, frankly. No, no, I don't think so. Okay, well. I mean, if you're not making basic... The, the, basis, the basis of all Buddhist practice is morality. It's an understanding of, of, of karma. It's a core morality. It's the basis of cause and effect. Of course, right. of course, but that's that's all that morality is based on, you know the 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 concept that or the the behavior that you you know you don't steal, you, you know we don't kill, we don't harm others, right. is is absolutely rooted in karma. It's not an arbitrary sort of social code. It's 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 an articulation of how karma works. Okay. I think morality, um, de I, you know, depending on where you live in the world, just, you know, and how you're raised, you know, it can be different at different times. But we're not talking about social codes here. We're talking about, you know, then, then I think that morality arises naturally as a result of, un of, a, of a mind that is not conditioned. I think morality. Say 
given where I live, given what kind of body I have, given um, what my nature is, given what I've learned, then I can be benefit for others as I think my own. I think that's kind of a, the, a base. Okay. So so anyway, let's yeah, let's get let's go on into you know what what are we renouncing? I wanted to share with you just a few words from Lamieshi on the topic of renunciation. If I can find where I was, there we go. So let's see where I was gonna. Okay. First of all, all of us consider that we would like to be free from ego mind and the bondage of samsara. But what binds us to samsara and makes us unhappy? I didn't I'm not reading this right. Hold on. But oh, okay. But what binds us to samsara and makes us unhappy is not having renunciation. Now, what is renunciation? What makes us renounced? The reason we are unhappy is because we have extreme craving for sense objects, samsaric objects, and we grasp at them. We are seeking to solve our problems, but we are not seeking in the right place. The right place is our own ego grasping. We have to loosen that tightness. That's all. According to the Buddhist point of view, monks and nuns are supposed to hold renunciation vows. The meaning of monks and nuns renouncing the world is that they have less craving for and grasping at sense objects. But you cannot say that they have already given up samsara because monks and nuns still have stomachs. (laughs) The thing is that the English word renounce is linguistically tricky. You can say that monks and nuns renounce their stomachs, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they actually throw their stomachs away. So I want you to understand that renouncing sensory pleasure doesn't mean throwing nice things away. Even if you do, it doesn't mean that you've renounced them. (laughs) (laughs) Renunciation is a totally inner experience. Renunciation of samsara does not mean you throw samsara away because your body and your nose are samsara. How can you throw your nose away? Your mind and body are samsara. Well, at least mine are. So I cannot throw them away. Therefore, renunciation means less craving. It means being more reasonable instead of putting too much psychological pressure on yourself and acting crazy. The important point for us to know, then, is that we should have less grasping at sense pleasures, because most of the time, our grasping at and craving desire for worldly pleasure does not give us satisfaction. That's the main point. It leads to more dissatisfaction and to psychologically crazier reactions. That is the main point. If you have the wisdom and method to handle objects of the five senses perfectly, such that they do not bring negative reactions, it's all right for you to touch them. And as human beings, we should be capable of judging for ourselves how far we can go into the experience of sense pleasure without getting mixed up and confused. We should judge for ourselves. It is completely up to individual experience. It's like French wine. Some people cannot take it at all. Even though they would like to, the constitution of their nervous system just doesn't allow it. But other people can take a little, Others can take a bit more. Some can take a lot. I don't... uh, Therefore, there's long discussion about wine. 
<laughs> therefore, <laughs> coming to the conclusion, <laughs> therefore, the grasping attitude and useless actions have to be abandoned, and things that make your life meaningful and liberated have to be actualized. Just say that sentence. Absolutely. Therefore, the grasping attitude and useless actions have to be abandoned, and things that make your life meaningful and liberated have to be actualized. But I don't want you to understand only the philosophical point of view. We are capable of examining our own minds and comprehending what kind of mind brings everyday problems and is not worthwhile, both objectively and subjectively. This is the way that meditation allows us to cor correct our attitudes and actions. Don't think, my attitudes and actions come from my previous karma, therefore I can't do anything. That's misunderstanding karma. Don't think I'm powerless. Human beings do have power. We have the power to change our lifestyles, change our attitudes, change our habits. We can call that capacity Buddha potential, God potential, or whatever you want to call it. That's why Buddhism is simple. It is a universal teaching that can be understood by all people, religious or non-religious. The opposite of the renunciation of samsara, to put what I'm saying another way, is the extreme mind that we have most of the time, the grasping, craving mind that gives us an overestimated projection of objects which has nothing to do with the reality of those objects. So what thoughts have you? After all that very clear, <laughs> simple, simple, very simple presentation. The name of this is The Essence of Tibetan Buddhism, mm -hmm. Lama Thupta Nyeshe, my teacher, and it's free out there. The, the, this is from the first teaching, which is on the three principal aspects of the path. There's also a short teaching in the back on introduction to Tantra. It's a very lovely little collection. It surprises me always to it puts in my mind how important motivation for anything is motivation. It's all yes. about motivation. I can go out and make zillions of dollars and do all kinds of incredible things, but I yes. my motivation is in line and I and I can hold it and understand it. You know, it's one of the things that bothers me sometimes about when I hear about the difference between the East and the West, supposedly. Mm. You know, there's been great altruistic minds in the West from the yeah. Absolutely. We would have no art if there weren't for patrons. Mm -hmm. like yeah. Very altruistic. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have a tendency to overlook that. Mm -hmm. It's motivation. It's motivation. It's motivation. That's right. Absolutely. I had a friend, she used to say she wanted to be a Buddhist because she wanted to be happy. And she wanted other people to be happy, and that was it. She would remind herself of that constantly when mm -hmm. she got really complicated that that was why she was here mm -hmm. and um, for myself um, I take the all these medications and they really mess with my memory and they list drowsiness and dizziness mm -hmm. as side effects sure. and I will walk out of here today remembering very little of what I heard but I'll never forget that woman she said it 17 years ago that she studies Buddhism because she wants to be happy she wants others to be happy And that, it was so simple. Yes. That was so absolutely simple, yeah. Chocolate isn't... I remember when I first started studying Buddhism uh, and the idea of nothingness or emptiness. And uh, one of the teachers said, he, he, he put his hand and he said, it isn't that chocolate doesn't exist, Kelly. It's that chocolate isn't love. Mm. The love doesn't exist. Mm. Chocolate exists, mm. you know. And it's very difficult for me to understand, but that simple. I mean, I sat through hours of conversations about emptiness. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd walk out and it's still like so. <laughs> <laughs>
so yeah. stupid, you know? Oh, and no. Said to me, you know, <laughs> it's just that chocolate isn't love. Right. That's all it is. And, and that was something that was said to me 15 years ago that I've never forgotten. And I, I remember very much of what I heard here today. Right. So. So when we talk about craving for sense pleasures, right? Craving, grasping for sense pleasures. What does that mean to you? And, I, and actually, I'd like to bring that into your question and your example from the very beginning of class, right? In that hour we talked about, right? Of getting from... I really want, you know, I'm going to have the best reactions today. I'm going to be a compassionate, thoughtful person to, you know, in that moment, somebody cuts us off on Cerritos and, you know, this sort of explosion happens inside of being pissed off at that person. So where does craving for sense pleasures play a part in that moment? And you actually said it at the very beginning of class, too. Expectation? Expectation. Mm-hmm. Well, there's also, on the physical level, with anger, um, there's a real sense uh, thing. I mean, you know, we, our blood pressure goes up. Visceral. Uh, visceral, yeah. We get pumped with adrenaline. Sure. We feel powerful, like, you know, kill the sun, you know, whatever. <laughs> and some people get addicted to that. Mm-hmm. There's to that. that. Yes. That, that re- reaction. But the, isn't, before that, right? That's a whole conversation, certainly, that one. But before that, right, as we've, you know, we... We sit, let's say, just sort of a little scenario. You know, we start out our day, we, you know, we quietly have our cup of tea or cup of coffee in the morning before we go out. You know, maybe we even sit down and meditate for a few minutes and set a really good motivation, like Kelly was saying. You know, we, you know today I'm going to be a good person, I'm going to respond really well even to <sighs> difficult situations, right? So what's, when we do that, then what... What might we, what sort of habit might we also, at the same time, be falling into? Well, there's that. But we might be falling into a kind of expectation. Okay, I set myself a good motivation, so my day's going to go great. You You know? If I'm going to be kind, that's right. That's right. That's right. You know, I've you know I've been a good girl this morning, so it's all going to go really nicely for me today. You know? Yes, exactly. Instant karma is just going to flow for me, isn't it? I'm I'm a good girl, so it's all going to happen nicely. So then, (laughs) then, right? So that sense pleasure isn't so much to something like this as much as it is to you know an overestimation of circumstances you know the sense pleasure of being able to drive down Cerritos and have all the cars get out of my way (laughs) you know so I can go as fast as I want to despite whatever else anybody else possibly wants along the way you know that that all the lights are going to turn green that I'm going to be on time you know, all of those, you know, I'm going to get where I need to go with three minutes to spare so I have no anxiety about it. You know, all of those, it's all going to go perfectly. Right? Until. <laughs> right. But that's the expectation. Until I get so it, 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 there, if we don't have that expectation, there is no until. Is there? Right? If we walk out the door saying, I'm, it's going to be a disaster today. And, utter, you know, everything's, I'm going to be late. The, the lights are all going to go red. People are going to cut me off. I'm going to be abused by salespeople. The, you know, the people at work are just not going to find my work satisfactory. It's all going to go like, shit, <laughs> excuse me. It's just really going to be a disaster. 
If you expect that, no, not necessarily at all. You will, if you expect that to happen, then if it does happen, you know, you may have a really smooth day. Wow, that'll be even better. But if something does go wrong, you're not going to be taken by surprise. You're not, it's not going to be a shock. You're it's, suggesting expect the worst. <laughs> a part of me is, say, is suggesting expect the worst in the sense of if, if we really are in samsara, if we really are in cyclic existence, then the nature of cyclic existence is dissatisfaction, is problems, is difficulties. If we're constantly sort of having the expectation that things aren't going to be difficult then we're constantly taken at a disadvantage because we're unprepared. And this comes from a really early, 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 early condition. So I think it's where so much of our confusion... <laughs> Very possible, yes, culture, yes. You studied hard, you worked hard... You That's did right. This, you did this, you Success. This. That's right. That's what was being offered to you, and we, we, we kind of live our life like that. I right. Do, to some degree. When I catch myself, but, it's better. But... But we, but we hurt ourselves. But life isn't like that, and we hurt ourselves because we react badly. You know, we flip the guy off. We get really upset. You know, the the woman at the at the you know at the grocery store is, you know, at at the at the best brusque, and at the worst rude. And you know, it's like it's like a shock to our nervous system because of our mindset, because of our expectation that. All women standing at the cash register in grocery stores should be respectful and nice. That's right. And customers always right. You know, and all of this, you know, we, we carry around concepts. All of these concepts are a, are a part of our samsara, are a part of our conditioned existence. And part of meditation, part of actually sitting down with our minds is paying attention to these concepts which are contributing to our life being more difficult than it has to be. If, if we can dissolve these concepts of expectation and replace them with different ways of thinking, you know, co- a kind of cognitive training, then we become more in harmony with the reality of our existence and better able to navigate because we have deeper wisdom, we have deeper understanding of how, simply how life functions. It's as simple as that. So, you know, part of, you know, one aspect of renouncing craving sense pleasures is renouncing craving that everything goes okay. I'm reading a book <coughs> called Bloodlands, which is in Europe between 1933 and 1945. And um, I, kind of, I kind of see, I understand, my understanding of what you're saying is it's like a church practice that, you know, this is I don't, I don't mean to sound grim or anything, but it's like, I do, I, I do, I meditate, sometimes I do, I meditate on that, yeah, sure. on that ex- experience that human beings have, and then sometimes I'll sp- open it up more to what's happening in the present day, and um, so I think, I, I look at it as an inoculation, as having a little shot, mm-hmm. of, of, because that does exist in the world, and we are in So I, I uh, see that as uh, having a little inoculation periodically you know, mm-hmm. to this. To where we okay, are. thank you. Yeah. You know, we become so attached to our ideas, thoughts, and concepts of how reality should be right. that we create great, great suffering. You know, I mean, 99.9% of everything I think and do is for myself. Yes. It isn't more. I'm going to fail every time. <laughs> that is like a huge delusion. 
Well, there isn't the one you think there is anyway. Huh? There isn't the one you think Thanks. there is anyway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Please. Isn't it better not to have any expectations than to have, you know, something like that? Because I feel like that could kind of manifest negativity if you're focusing on mm-hmm. that rather than just kind of being open to negative or positive things and just kind of being open to them, the possibilities. If if you're able to do that, this uh, I think what I'm calling attention to is a, is the um, first you have to figure out that you have expectations and identify them, and it it can be a useful exercise to you know to consciously um, as a training sort of consciously generate the opposite as an experiment you know to see okay what does that do to my experience. You know, if I expect everybody to be cutting me off, then isn't it nice to be pleasantly surprised when everybody doesn't, for example? But it's a, it's a training exercise to be able to actually work with your mind and be aware of what your expectations really are. And to also have the experience of, you know, having the power to adjust them. So, yes... If you can reside in that in that open space where you're not clinging in either direction, super. But sometimes it takes, you know, some steps to be able to actually get there. And knowing that you you know that we can, that we're not at the mercy of you know whatever happens to be passing through our heads, but that we have we have capability, we have power. In, in that realm of our experience to be able to adjust and manipulate and maneuver and change is a really helpful exercise, you know, in, in training. And then, you know, if you can go beyond that, of course, you know, and let go of clinging in either direction, even better, certainly. To lose my temper and then see that I've lost my temper and then remind myself that I don't want to lose my temper and then find a place of equanimity. I remember I was watching some show about China and I said something to my daughter about how I hated the Chinese for what was going on in Tibet and how the Dalai Lama had forgiven the Chinese and she looked at me and she said, oh honey, you're not the Dalai Lama, you know. So to remind myself that I'm not perfect, you know, I'm not... There's this person that I set out to be, but I'm not that person. Mm-hmm. That these are my requests of myself, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And when I disappoint myself, to not sit in that disappointment, but to rather look at it. Like mm-hmm. we talk uh, about meditation, mm-hmm. thinking, you know, reacting, whatever, and going back to that place where I want to behave, regardless of, of how other people act. This is who I want to be. Um, Uh, Daniel, just a second. Rowena. Okay. Um, This is sort of speaking to the expectations thing. I used to have a friend who was brilliant verbally. In spite of his better instincts, he became an astrologer because he could describe these things. But he was so negative about everything and all his projections that everybody called him the black diamond. I mean, he was brilliant. But it was always just gloomy. And what was really startling is he ended up dying fairly young of brain cancer with nine tumors in his head. And I couldn't help but wonder if, and maybe it had nothing to do with it, but the intensity of negativity and how it would collect. And I would watch my own negativity, which was horrendous at about the same time, Um, because that's when my kids were becoming teenagers and... (laughs) You know, that kind of thing was going on. But what I'm looking at is is the... uh, tendency for us to take our expectations, make them a whole thing, and like th- as if we're throwing an anchor way out ahead of us and trying to bring our boat along without paying any attention to the channel or the currents in the water. Because we're looking, we're not paying attention to the, how our mind is working as we go forward. Okay, I've got something I'm going over here for, and therefore I forget. Like if I pull out of here, and I've done this regularly because I come here fairly regularly, and I've got to get down to the post office, am I going to just barrel out of here? No, there's a lot of tricky traffic, particularly at this next light. And so I, ha- I cannot do that, even if my expectation is to get to the post office in seven minutes. 
And so I have to really watch the flow of the traffic or I plane won't get there. And when it comes to my temper, which can be really, really tricky, I have to remember that if I allow a certain velocity of negative thoughts to pile up, before long I am mad at a whole lot of stuff. There's a lot of very upsetting things in the world right now, you know. And so it's, it's a matter of watching how I move incrementally watching the flow of traffic at the same times I may have the goal to get to the post office but I'm not going to get there any more time or less really by about it depends on the light of Cerritos right but it's 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 like a matter of monitoring how I handle things as I go because if I allow the negativities to build up I mean I can get absolutely frantic and I won't drive any better and I won't get there any faster you see what I mean? I'll just get bummed out. In the meantime, if I just get there, I get there. And I won't have flipped out because of something happening internationally or, you know, something some of the grandchildren are doing. In the meantime, because I have all this other garbage I bring with me as I'm trying to get to the post office, which conditions almost every way I handle my car. And I'm using that somewhat metaphorically. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I'm the same way. Expectations, I, it's almost like a, a catch bag. Let's throw all expectations out. Expectations are what I think frame our lives. I don't think you'd go to the post office if you didn't expect it to be open. You wouldn't go at midnight. It's not the expectations, how we deal with the expectation when it's not fulfilled in the way that we want it to be fulfilled. The expectations, I mean, all, all, you run the center. Somebody expects us to pay the rent on time. Somebody expects us to do this. They're all expectations. The whole framework of business in the practical world. There might be another world where expectations <laughs> loosens you or frees you if you don't have them. No, I uh, no, I don't. I don't think so. I th I think there I think there are ways to make distinctions here. Okay. Um, it's not expect you know it's not expectation between um, a landlord and a tenant that the the rent will be paid on time. It's an agreement. That's different. And you expect that agreement to be kept. Well, yes, you expect that agreement to be kept. That's the expectation part, but, but, you know, I think partly what we're talking about is, you know, expectations as projections on how life will go. Unknown. Yes. Okay. Yes. But you can you can put projections on agreements. I mean, accept. Yes. Yes, you can. You can. Then, but the, but then you have but you know if for me to be sitting at home, wherever my home is, I say I live in. South Santa Fe, right? So, uh, you know, sometime between 9.20 and 10, I have to drive from South Santa Fe to the center because at 10 o'clock there's a class, okay? So I'm sitting in my house. So expectations, uh, you know, uh, that, the, that the center is going to be open right. isn't an expectation in, the, in this context that I'm talking about it. That the center is going to be open is at least to some degree based on knowledge because we've made some agreements that there's, you know, there's advertising happened and, you know, there are people who have agreed to come and unlock the door. So, so that expectation actually has some roots in knowledge of reality. My expecting that Cerritos is going to be absolutely empty of traffic if I happen to have that thought in my head is just an exp is just a fantasy. Based on conditions, based on experience. Mm, not no, not necessarily. To some degree, to some degree. But a lot of times, we uh, our expectations are more fantasy than reality. Right, and and the expectations that we have that are in our favor that make us feel good are ones that we cling to. You know, that, you know, I'm going to be able to get in my car and zoom right up Surios, you know, and there's not going to be one red light, and nobody's going to get in my way. And, I mean, that's just a really mundane example. But, you know, but yeah, sure, I have that as I walk out my door. Am I aware of it? And am I aware of how that's going to, what effect that's going to have on my reactions? Is a, is a different question. And if I expect, you know, okay, I'm leaving at 17 till, 
it actually, in all reasonableness, it takes me 17 minutes to get to the center. But I expect to be early. You know, and then things get in the way. And because I'm not going to be early, but I have this niggling expectation in my head, you know, that I'm, because I want to, it's like a, you know, trying to make wish fulfillment happen, then I get upset. No, then my then my life becomes needlessly unhappy out of not being very in touch with reality. Exactly. In touch with reality. Okay. So, so so awareness of our expectations <coughs> you know so we have some control over them and some assessment of them and the sense of renunciation back to our theme of the, you know, you know, it's not even so much that the expectations, they're an obstacle, certainly. They can be an obstacle. But what's, what's also an obstacle is our grasping onto them as if they're real. Our not being aware of them and then our holding on to them as if we, you know, like, one person said earlier, you know, I deserve to have this happen to me. You know, that sort of self-centered clinging. So grasping the clinging, gr- grasping the clinging, grasping at, you know, those things, you know, those, what Lama Yeshi called sensory pleasures. You know, the things that make us feel good. Doesn't mean we should never feel good. Absolutely not. We should, the whole point of this is to sort of increase our, you know, satisfaction in life. But satisfaction and pleasure are kind of two different categories of experience. Satisfaction is something much more lasting. 